I just wanted, uh, first, Jonathan, thank you for that fantastic presentation. Um, very far-reaching and uh, clearly something that is going to need to be taken very seriously by a wide range of, of actors. Um, can I just ask a couple of questions about, about the sort of the fundamental uh, elements there? Um, at the end, you were talking about a, a need to change the way we look at this, uh, this approach. And it seems to me there's a fundamental shift in terms of how we look at risk um, due to climate change, which is to do with being much more forward-looking. Uh, we can't rely on the sort of one in, a one in a thousand risk of flooding type of scenarios which are based largely on historical mm. measures. It's a fundamental shift. Um, how are you seeing that sort of play out in, in real business, government uh, thinking? Uh, is, is, that, is that change in thinking really coming in or are we still having to, is there still a long way to go before people, you know, institute, large global institutions realise the, 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 a complete shift in, in the view? Well, I think so far for us, the, uh, the response has fallen into three different, I mean, it's been, we've thought about it in three areas, finance, infrastructure, and planning, mm. sort of more, more generally. And so, and from the financial community, I have to say that we've seen more action in the last 12 months than mm. we've seen in the last 12 years. Mm. Uh, just in the number of climate risk analytics firms that have been established, the uh, responses across asset manage the asset management community. Uh, as was known, Larry Fink uh, put out the letter on to shareholders, which highlighted the, the not only the, the both the physical and the transition risks associated with climate. Uh, and I think there's so I think this is now past the stage where it could be viewed as being something new in a sense. I mean, it's mm. it's, it's now business part of the business model for finance. Sorry, um, the. Um, the infrastructure community, I think, has uh, been a little slower, frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that there is sort of a recognition that this uh, next wave of infrastructure needs to incorporate this science, but I think there's uh, perhaps some you know, concern. I mean, it's, it is a more of a process. Like what we've seen is certain industries are actually at the leading edge. So mm -hmm. industries which have had some exposure to extremes in the forest, I would highlight the oil and gas industry, for example, mm -hmm. um, so the forestry industry. Um, where you find players who have done this analysis and, and really do know the rate of which deforestation is happening and what you have to do about it or how fast the tundra is melting and what's it doing to your pipeline. And that's a and dynamic. <laughs> it's not just that it's different, but it's a it's, an it's a fun, Yes, they, they, they would be amongst the most, I think the oil companies are amongst the most, if you talk to the operators, they're mm. amongst the most convinced people in the world about what's going on in physical climate risk because yeah. you can measure it in Alaska in the drilling season. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so... Uh, and then finally, public sector is the last one, which is mm. the planning mm. part. And I think there it's been a bit, I have to say, reactive. Mm. It's like when there is a crisis, there is a response. And yeah. so Florida mm. or India. So. Mm. Yeah. And then just mm. on behavioral change, because, mm. I mean, that's a, that's a major part there. And I think that's something which certainly at a personal as well mm. as at the sort of large institutional level, mm. we can understand that there has to be a big shift there. Um, my sense is that that behavioural shift in a social sense takes mm. quite some time. I mean, we're already feeling the impact of climate change. Behaviours have changed, but have they changed mm. enough? And how do you see the interaction between that behavioural shift and you know, the institutional shift, which you're saying are, in some cases, very advanced? Well, I, I mean, it's a, it's a, I, I enjoy the topic, and uh, I find this, this question of what's a crisis to be fascinating. It's like, you know, what a, a defining crisis is sort of this, I, I, I define it by the outcomes. It's like a crisis is when we do things differently. Yeah. And so what define, when, under what situations do we do things differently? I can tell you in North America, apparently we do things differently when we want a football stadium. <laughs> it's that we clearly have a football stadium crisis. So, um, so we, will, we will change our zoning codes. We will adapt our tax structures. We will, we will mobilize employment in order to have a football stadium. Affordable housing, not so much. Uh, but uh, the, uh, you know, the, the question of climate then, I mean, falls into that category. Mm. When do we define crisis? And how does that change our doing business as usual conversation. And mm. I, I think some places clearly have. Physical climate risk is spatial. Mm. Uh, and mm. so, yes, India has changed and will continue to change. And I think mm. China is actually changing. You know, they are they're experiencing those flooding impacts and the hence the sponge cities initiative. So mm. we do see that. And I'd argue that China and Asia, more generally, will be at the center of, of this change, that mm. behavioral shifts as you can see in China, mm -hmm. it happens very quickly when we define a crisis. So, yeah. uh, so we've all been bumping elbows now. So, yeah. Yeah. Like that. yeah. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Rob, if I can turn to you, um, 
you're familiar with the report, uh, I think, mm -hmm. and um, uh, you obviously look at, at the Grantham Institute, that, that interaction between sort of the international relations, uh, government approaches, policy, and also the wider business approach to, to climate risk. Um, this used to be something which was a forecast. This used to be something which people would think mm. about is a future. You know, how do we prepare mm. for this? Um, that's changed, I think. We're, we're now seeing this is a much more real mm. problem now. Mm. How are you looking at that? Uh, and what's your view on how that can, uh, will play out? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And yes, I'm, I'm familiar with the report. And I, I should mention I'm an avid reader of all the McKinsey reports that you've produced for the last, well, over 10 years now. And what's interesting is you mentioned the, the cost curve, the, the carbon uh, reduction cost curve that McKinsey produced a good 10 years ago. And I've been using that in a lot of uh, teaching as well. Uh, the debate 10 years ago used to be focused on the question of, well, is it possible to do anything about what looks like an imaginary future risk? And so your uh, McKinsey's work on this was very important because you showed it's actually possible to do it to cut back emissions provided it's a serious enough problem. But with this report, you are delivering the, that other piece of that in that conversation, which is to, to say, what are we waiting for? You know, we ought to be doing this, because those risks are no longer either imagined or hypothesized, modeled, and happening sometime in the future. They're happening right now, and they're measurable, they're, they're impactful, and then people are hurting, people are suffering as a consequence of that. So I think that's an important shift in the debate, and I think that the report couldn't be timelier for that reason. So that has had an impact on the whole climate debate in business but also in politics, which I just want to touch on briefly. Ten years ago, and anyone who's been in the debate for long enough remembers the debate from 20 years ago, uh, when this was seen as a bit of a fringe debate and, and it was the green sort of lobby that would push global warming as an issue. Um, and scientific debates about is it happening so on. We've long left that behind. But even ten years ago, you needed to make an argument for climate action on the basis of your green beliefs, your environmentalist credentials, and, and you needed to make an argument about what we value, nature versus the economy and so on. Those were pretty state debates. But now, see who's joining the debate and who is arguing uh, quite forcefully about the need for action. It's people who can't get flood insurance because their homes are in floodplains. It's the investors, the institutional investors, who are saying, what am I going to do about stranded ass assets? Uh, how will I value the assets that I currently have in my portfolio? So it's a much broader debate now, and I think that's really helpful to know, and the report, I think, does that, that we have tools at our hand to establish what is the urgent need for action, and I think that's where the debate has shifted. That gives me reason for hope, though I agree with Jonathan that that sense of crisis isn't strong enough yet for all of us to take action. And uh, <coughs> we obviously have COP26 um, coming up towards the end of the year. Hopefully that will be able to go ahead. There's been a bit of discussion around that um, because of the, the, the coronavirus mm -hmm. outbreak. But assuming it goes ahead or assuming those international discussions do continue, there is a sense that you know, the whole um, you know, outcome of, of being able to deal with climate change is based on you know, every one of these big rounds of debates comes as, it's, if it doesn't work, then that's it, sort of game over. Um, it's clearly a lot more complex than that. There's a lot of national uh, policy issues. There, there are regional policy issues. We look at Southeast Asia quite often as a group. You obviously have what's going on within Europe and, and between the OECD countries. Um, but are you hopeful that uh, that new approach, perhaps you know, the urgency, the forward-looking, the more dynamic approach, is being taken into account in those international for in, in, a, in a sort of broader international relations sense? Mm. Um, and, and do you think that we will will see some of that uh, having a, a tangible impact uh, on adaption and preparation uh, out of mm -hmm. COP26 mm -hmm. and, the, and the upcoming discussions. So on one of the last slides that you showed, Jonathan, um, you, you gave us the different emission paths for mm -hmm. 1.5 degree or 2 degree uh, target uh, within this century. And the good news is we have an international agreement, the Paris Agreement, where countries have committed to keeping global warming to under 2 degrees and ideally aim for a 1.5 degree uh, target. So, so we have a global agreement on that. We didn't have that in the past, we have it now. That allow, okay, we'll come to the United States in a moment, I'm sure, in the <laughs> Q&A session. But for now we have it. 4th of November is the date when the US leaves uh, the, the Paris Agreement. So things can change in between now and then. Um, one lives in hope. 
Um, so, so, the, so what this means is we also have now an idea of how much more we can emit. And I, on one of your slides, I think you mentioned the carbon budget. It was hidden in the slide, so I just want to emphasize it again. We have an understanding of how much more CO2 and other greenhouse gases we can emit over the course of this century to, in order to stick to 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees. And so we have a target for the global community, for the world economy overall, and ultimately it's a collective challenge. Whatever we do here, or in the United States, or whatever China does, is neither here nor there unless everyone more or less joins in. So, so the framework is there. We, we have a, an accounting tool for getting there, and we have a political agreement. So now it's down to what do individual countries do in their national context to reduce those emissions. And that's the challenge, because that curve was rather steep. It pointed way down. We need to get to net zero before, by or before 2050. I just want to emphasize this, net zero. It used to be a debate about by how much should we reduce emissions before the end of the century. Um, and it used to be a, a classic question in big audiences like this. Is it enough, one would ask, to reduce emissions by 20, 30, 50% by the end of the century? And you would always get about 50% in the audience who would say, yeah, that's probably enough. And it emphasizes we need to get down to zero, not just by 2100, but by 2050. So this is the <coughs> absolute imperative. The challenge is translating that into action. Mm. And that's where the Paris Agreement, as you, I think, were hinting, mm. doesn't give us that level of confidence yet, because it's based on voluntary commitments. Nations have made pledges that they need to review now, going into COP26 in Glasgow. Those reviews, those, those sort of increases in ambition, they're based on domestic priorities, not mm. international priorities. There's no international mechanism to agree the distribution of emissions. This is a very much a bottom-up process. And so we're relying at the moment on a system where we, we think countries will get to the right level of ambition because they accept the global challenge. Mm -hmm. And so the, the COP26 is important because that mechanism of reviewing those pledges, increasing the pledges, has to be done in the run-up to 26. And I'm not quite sure yet we're there in okay. terms of the momentum behind that. Okay, thank you. Um, Jonathan, if I can, so thinking about that, you know, that need to, to governments, a multilateral framework, large institutions think about this. Um, is this. Is this something that can, can be dealt with in a simple way through market pricing? Or is it, are we beyond that point? Can the risk be priced? Can markets, if there's enough mm. multilateral agreement, if there's enough alignment on policy, will the market be able to, to, to deal with this through... through you know, I know it's much more complex, but through a pricing uh, mechanism, or do we need, or, or, or is that not just not going to be enough? Well, I, I, I think that first of all, all of these things will move, if you will, in parallel or in sync. Mm -hmm. It's like regulations, uh, capital, uh, market sentiment, uh, talent, mm -hmm. uh, innovation. I mean, those are the five sort of drivers of the sustainability tipping points, mm -hmm. and different things work in different places. Yeah. So. We know that for the automotive sector, you need standards. Mm, mm. Uh, you can price anything you want, but if you don't actually put a standard in place, energy efficient or the cafe standards won't. You know, if you don't have that, you won't. You won't see an increase in fleet fuel efficiency. It's mm, been mm. so. But others, you know, places that pricing may be very effective, and uh, you know, whether it's taxation or carbon pricing of some sort. Uh, and, you know, I think actually what we've seen is that, first of all, market sentiment is now real. So mm -hmm. the green consumer is a real consumer mm -hmm. and that, that is actually willing to pay and moving, moving market share across, across industries. Um, talent is extraordinarily sensitized and uh, because of the increased transparency that digital cre creates, the uh, ability to quote unquote greenwash is much less now. You really do have to uh, live up to your, whatever you're committing or you face a talent issue. Uh, and then finally, innovation responds. I mean, it's a, as these markets develop, we are seeing, you know, the learning curves uh, are materializing costs of whether it's renewables or, uh, or carbon, uh, or grid storage, I mean, is, is, is continuing to decline. So each of those things has its place. You know, I, the question that, 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 that Richard raised is absolutely right. It's like, so do we, are we gonna run out of runway here? Mm. What's, our, what's our time frame? If you mm. look at the 1.5 degree pathway, that's a, that's a vertical line. So, uh, 
that is actually the next subject for MGI research okay. is the uh, is the cost of that transition, right. and uh, and we frame it that way because it's a real cost. Yeah. I mean, there are assets which will be stranded mm. by transition as mm. much as by physical Absolutely. risk, and so in some ways one has to weigh those two neither particularly appetizing yeah. uh, paths and decide which one is the more effective approach. Okay. Great. I just want to take a couple of questions. Well, sorry, did you just, want to just respond? Quickly? Just quickly on carbon yeah. prices. It's an interesting debate that keeps coming back, particularly in, in the context of economists and business leaders talking to each other. Mm. So it's, it's, in a way, it's the holy grail in that debate. Yeah. Do they work or not? I just want to make one point. Uh, we haven't even tried carbon pricing properly. Sure. The, the World Bank's high-level panel on carbon pricing that produced a report in 2017. Nick Stern from the LSE, our chair at the Grantham Institute, but also Joe Stiglitz and other economists came together and tried to establish what would be an optimal carbon price. And they came up with a, a figure of between 40 and 100 US dollars by 2050. That would be an optimal price. Look around the world. Where are carbon prices at the moment? In the European Union, we've just thanks to some reforms, pushed up the price to about 28 US dollars, 25 euros thereabout. So that's still far off where it should be. Mm. The Chinese pilots that they've run in, in seven cities, they see carbon prices at the moment between, I think, three and four US dollars and 10 and 11 dollars. And in California, last time I looked, it was 14 to yeah. 18 dollars. So I, I'd say we haven't even tried, right? Before we write of carbon prices, how about we uh, put in a proper carbon price that reflects the urgency of the task. So that would be my plea in okay. that area. All right, thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, Jeremy, you've got a microphone. I think you can just uh, uh, just explain your, just give your name and your affiliation if you ask a question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeremy Grant at PwC. Very struck, as I'm sure many in the room were, by um, Jonathan, your, your slide on Ho Chi Minh City and the prognostications, which are pretty grim if that plays out. I was just flicking through the report looking at your acknowledgement section and noticed that Bristol City Council was acknowledged. And the reason I put those two things together is to ask a question, which is cities surely are very much at the frame in terms of finding a solution here, at least for large amounts of the human population, given that urbanization is not stopping anytime soon. What's the role for cities here in terms of you know, bringing about pivot points and action and addressing this? Well, it's a, a terrific question, and I enjoy, I mean, as, a, as an urbanist, <laughs> sort of, I, I will, I'll try to restrain myself. Um, but uh, the, uh, well, first of all, a shout out to the Bristol City Council, I mean, for, for being uh, forward looking, right, in the sense that Bristol hasn't experienced major flooding, <laughs> at least not recently that we've noticed. Um, but um, they have taken the time to think it through and saying, what might be, we be exposed to? And they have actually done the work to look at what happens in the event of the one in, one in 200 year flood becoming a one in 100 year or one in 50 year uh, event that, and uh, they are effectively tide locked. So when that happens, then things flood and it, and it stays there. So it, uh, the, and the downtown is, is in that sense not movable. So there's, there's this very significant exposure. The hazard is rising. Their vulnerability is, is expanding. So it's nonlinear for them as well. And that has, as we note in the report, motivated them to go and start to look for uh, additional funding from beyond the city's budget to uh, provide flood defenses. So I, mean, I think that is, from our point of view, it's a, it's a good example of someone who has done the work to understand the risk and now is trying to adapt, in this case, to financially, physically and financially adapt. So cities, in that sense, are the, uh, you know, they, they are going to be one of, if not the you know, focal points for, uh, the um, system response. And it will be where that vulnerability materializes, whether it's the transformers and uh, uh, the grid, or it's the flooding of the, of, the, of, the, of the transport infrastructure. These things largely are urban. Now, there's not everything that's urban, but even things that don't affect, that aren't happening in the urban context do affect it. The wildfires in Australia would be an example of that. So I think that cities will be called on to respond not, even to, not only to the things that happen to them, but the things that happen around them that, that affect them. And that, uh, so that notion of rural-urban integration, if anything, will be accelerated because of this, uh, this systemic risk. And I think that's what it comes down to. This is systemic risk. It, uh, there, there's no place on the planet which will be an island. Uh, and so uh, all of our 
all of our cities, and the good news is that I think cities, is now, the cities are getting the bad news. And I, I find cities to be a remarkably resilient and responsive mechanism, as an organism. Uh, and so I, you know, but one should, one should be respectful of the challenge that uh, the only thing that has historically been damaging the cities in the long history of cities is climate. Mm. And uh, that's the only thing that has effectively removed cities from the landscape, and that would be the Mayan Empire. Um, so we don't need to follow that precedent. Mm. <laughs> well, I don't know if you want to have any. No. Uh, uh, yeah, we've got two questions there, maybe. Richard, and then we'll go to the next one. Thank you, Richard Lillieston from Guess Asia. Um, Jonathan, um, first of all, congratulations for what well, is a very thorough piece of work. Um, I have a, a question really relating to um, having identified the problem um, and the gravity of the problem. Um, what are your views about how we get it fixed? Because what I can see is that the solutions which are being provided by governments, the UK government in particular, um, are not going to get us there quickly enough, A, in terms of technology, B, in terms of cost efficiency. And if we are underpinning a road to zero, say, by 2050, based on the hydrogen economy and on carbon capture storage, um, simply we won't get there. And the science in many issues are flawed because um, although we may in fact reduce the carbon footprint, we are still producing more heat. And it's the anthropological heat which is the real problem as much as the carbon. I, I would probably defer to Robert on, on many of those <laughs> answers. I think that, first of all, the, as we said, there are the different tipping points. In terms of pace, I would argue that capital is going to move faster than regulation it's in terms of its it's, we can already see the response now and, uh, and the uh, sort of repricing of, of market, municipal market uh, assets, that, municipal bonds in North America that are in more climate exposed areas. The price of, for, to um, borrow is going to go up for those municipalities and that, that you know, then has a implication for the uh, attractiveness for investment. So there is a financial market response that I think will go very quickly. Capital, capital will move along. Um, that will in turn trigger a policy conversation about do we bail these people out or not? And, it's like, uh, and that, that is an interesting question as well. So, but I don't know, Robert, would you? I mean, it's, it's difficult to say what's the key solution that'll get us there quickly mm -hmm. enough. I, I think you need to lay on all technological and economic solutions that we can find. I think that also goes back to the McKinsey cost curve. In the end, it doesn't really matter what you focus on. You just need to try everything. and, and Ideally, also, you, you want to do this as quickly as possible, and it doesn't really matter whether you hit a particular target, a temperature target, because uh, keeping glo future global warming as low as possible, that's what we should aim for, even if we overshoot certain targets. There's no, there's no question of the next five years, the next ten years, or if we get this solution right or the other solution. Uh, uh, that's not the issue. We just need to keep trying. It's a long-term problem, and as you say, once capital starts moving, that might actually make things a lot easier to achieve because we're then getting the right investment in place that we don't have. And I, I would like to underline the, the investment challenge, because we, a lot of routine investment that's currently being uh, undertaken isn't yet climate proof or isn't yet in the low carbon uh, section. Um, we've just had an interesting court ruling on Heathrow expansion that sent, I think, a, a powerful signal, to, particularly to the government, that whatever public infrastructure investment you're going to make, you need to start thinking about how that tallies with your legislated climate target. And so, so I, we can debate which solutions will work at, in what time frames. I think we just need to get going and start now across the board. That would be my key message. Thank you. And we had another question there, uh, just in the middle. Thank you. Um, Peter Williams from Bridge, a development consultancy in Beijing. Um, my question, you mentioned the uh, you know, substantive actions China's taken domestically uh, to achieve its Paris targets, uh, but I wanted to ask about the Belt and Road. Um, I think I, there's a study suggesting the share of carbon emissions of BRI countries will rise from about a third currently, globally, to about two thirds by 2050, and there seems to be evidence that China isn't, is funding a lot of coal-fired power stations in BRI projects and it's not applying the same standards there. How do you, I just want, what, I wonder what your take on that is. Is there evidence of change there? Well, I, uh, I think again, that's, that's a mitigation conversation, but I, I think it's fair to, to I mean, those are the facts. I mean, I think China has funded a large amount of uh, carbon intensive energy production. It's not just coal, <laughs> so, uh, gas pipelines as well and other things. So. Um, 
and I, you know, I think they have a right to be called out. I mean, in that sense, I think the, uh, you know, the conversation needs to, again, become much more practical, if you will, about the transition and uh, what is the uh, sovereign risk that's entailed by continuing to rely on high carbon forms of energy production uh, when there is a, an alternative. And so I think that, that it's been, that's been the, uh, the, the inability to have that conversation has been the challenge to date. So I think that, uh, but, and ultimately I, I actually feel like, you know, first of all, BRI in the context of global infrastructure is, is, is not very big. So it's, uh, you know, the, uh, the global spend on infrastructure is in the trillions and, uh, and uh, annually, and BRI is in, is in the, at the most, the tens of billions. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's a, there's a, there, there's a power, it has an influence, of course, and, and you know, we see it all the time. Um, but and I think it's much more about China's own behavior that, that we were talking about as opposed to changing the shape of global infrastructure, which I think is a very important conversation that, that requires us to engage with sovereigns uh, around the world. I, mean, I, I think ultimately this, as was raised in our conversations at Davos by you know, a representative from Pakistan, is saying, you know, there is a, you know, you can't make me choose from between, you know, the, the environment and my ability to put, put, turn the lights on in a hospital. <laughs> uh, so, you know, that, that, that is a political reality. So we need to create an alternative. The good news, I think, is that as we recognize that that's not a viable choice for a local decision maker to make, that the multilateral community has options and can step in. And I think that's where China can play a more constructive role, is engaging on a multilateral basis, uh, whether it's through MIGA, and extending that to climate, which is one of the suggestions that has been made, the Insurance Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, uh, or it's through institutions like AIIB or, uh, uh, other, or the NDB for that matter. I mean, just ensuring that they come out with codes of conduct and standards and define what is green infrastructure and green production, um, that, that is where China can make a, make a step forward and, and demonstrate actual leadership. And we had a, a, a mm -hmm. conference on Belt and Road Initiative um, last month and one of the things that, that was debated and there was no conclusion or consensus but that the challenge noted that uh, China is pushing on the Belt and Road, it's not just simply the Belt and Road Initiative but a lot of the developing countries along the route are keen to keep the lights on, are keen to develop, it's, it's that sort of question, there's this sort of distributive justice question about, mm. which is you know, age old between the OECD and the emerging world. Um, but if you add the pressure of making clean um, and green infrastructure um, into that, you, you, you certainly enter major debates which I don't think have been resolved at a multilateral level. Is this something that you've looked at at the Grantham Institute? Do you, are you looking at the kind of solutions that, that may help resolve some of those issues? Uh, yeah, we, we certainly are looking at that, particularly with the, the COP26 debate focused on finance. This is going to be one of the, the tricky issues in, in the debate. It's been a long-standing uh, sort of fault line in international climate negotiations, the question of if we're all in this together, if we're all having to take action, who's going to pay the distributional consequences of climate mitigation are, are right at the top of that agenda. And what we have at the moment is a bit of a standoff between northern and southern countries in the sense that northern countries have promised to invest or to generate flows, finance flows of, uh, at the moment the, the figure is still 100 billion per year. Uh, we're now see, trying to see whether we can move beyond that. But many developing countries have said, well, um, before we even talk about increasing that promise, let's see some action, let's, let's do the accounting of what has actually flown as yet. Mm. Um, and there's still quite a bit of distrust in the system, and I think that's bogging down the negotiations that a lot of developing countries are not getting the support financially, politically, but also technologically that they feel they deserve in that area. Mm. China is stepping into the breach, and, and your question is absolutely right. I think China's decisions on domestic but also foreign investment are critical in the debate, but nobody can compete with China in terms of the scale of its investment flows. But please bear in mind, uh, as our Prime Minister said at the Africa Summit, uh, Britain is going to stop funding coal projects in the developing world, but he was quickly reminded we are still using foreign aid to fund gas and to some extent uh, oil projects too. So we are still in the business of supporting uh, fossil fuel energy projects around the world. So China is not alone in facing those difficult challenges. Indeed. Well, look, I think that's a great place 
question of who's going to pay for it. I think this is something probably in our next panel we'll, we'll have a lot more to uh, talk about. But um, ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in thanking Jonathan and Robert for <laughs>